Good evening, everyone. Um, Will usually does the honors on this, and it's good to see him back, uh, see him standing, see him moving. Uh, and uh, but we want to thank uh, <coughs> the URI Vice President for Administrative and Finance for bringing this uh, this presentation to us, and also the College of Environmental and Life Sciences and the Rhode Island ASLA and the Rhode Island uh, Chapter of the American Planning Association. They're the sponsors. Tonight, we're very lucky to have uh, someone that I knew many years ago uh, when I was a, a student. I can't believe that he hasn't changed. I just got older. Um, but anyways, Nicholas Dines, he's a, uh, <coughs> he's a fellow in ASLA. Uh, he's, uh, he taught at the University of Massachusetts for 34 years. Uh, he's done books. Uh, he's written books. Most of you know his uh, design and his design drawing books, but more importantly, you know his construction books. Each and every one of you has one of uh, his, uh, <laughs> his, his um, uh, construction handbook uh, on your desk. So uh, it's that big, heavy green one that you're supposed to open at least once a day. Um, and he, he lives up in uh, just west of uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, in a little town called Williamsburg, Mass, where he's actually been working on a process, a process that's taken a number of years. It's about public landscapes, and it's making that commitment as a citizen to make it a, uh, an improvement and a commitment to a, a better quality of life. Uh, <coughs> he's taken the profession of landscape architecture and actually brought it into his own community to uh, make his own community much more livable more enjoyable, and certainly more healthy. Um, he's going to talk to us tonight uh, about uh, these kinds of projects. I also want to mention that most of you are going to go to the uh, ASLA <coughs> convention in Boston uh, November 15th. He's going to be uh, receiving <coughs> uh, the American Society of Landscape Architecture. is going to recognize him for his 13-year public garden project and the recent Greenway advocacy for the uh, 2013 Community Service Awards, which will, uh, which will be presented to him uh, at ASLA. So I know that we've got more than 25 to 30 people going to Boston. So you uh, may hear his uh, name mentioned, and you'll say, ah, I heard him down at URI. <laughs> but I'm going to turn it over to Nick, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much for uh, hosting this event and uh, asking uh, that I part participate. Today, uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to present some case studies of some projects that I worked on. And uh, this is not to meant to be a showcase of projects I've worked on, because I'm going to try to tell you what, uh, what I learned from doing these things and what I think the significance uh, of them are uh, for you as a young landscape architecture uh, uh, professional, uh, an emerging professional, and also what it uh, means uh, in terms of a historical perspective. In 1999, uh, Boston hosted the ASLA annual meeting, and they celebrated 100 years of landscape architecture in America. And uh, all of us who uh, were uh, landscape architects were asked to partake, participate in some kind of pro bono work in our communities uh, to um, enhance the awareness of landscape architecture, propagate its knowledge, and uh, uh, create uh, beautiful places. So I took it upon myself to, to start a, a project in Williamsburg, Massachusetts, where I live, to create a public landscape that didn't exist. And uh, I was reminded uh, uh, for, by that, uh, for that by the work of Frederick Olmsted, Charles Eliot, and others of that era who, in fact, worked tirelessly to propagate a public landscape. And I marveled at um, the, the observation that it took 100 years for the, for the profession of landscape architecture to forget why it started. And that is the total abandonment of the idea of a public landscape and uh, developing, uh, using design and planning skills for, for spatial and temporal equity. 
uh, in our society. And so uh, with that little background, I'd like to present uh, what I call uh, the design of the caring garden. And these include uh, public landscape uh, gardens and uh, hospital gardens, as well as some uh, river uh, greenway restoration work uh, which serve as models for various uh, other projects. So I'd like to begin um, <clears throat> by going back to this idea that uh, in a Central Park in New York City uh, opened in 1857 uh, and uh, it, it became a, um, a hallmark uh, of design for the public sphere. And it borrowed artifacts from private estates it accommodated urban public, and um, I like to make an observation. Are there any musicians in the audience? Any musicians? Well, one of the problems of, of designing in the public realm is that uh, you have to design uh, using many time signatures in the same composition because there are different reasons for people to be in these public spaces, and they have different um, time, time, refer time space references. And so the classic designs uh, that you find, if you study them carefully in, in Olmsted's work in New York City, in fact does that. It accommodates uh, people uh, for different reasons uh, and uh, at different paces. So uh, the caring garden, what I call, you know, we often talk about we have to care for gardens. Well, the gardens care for us. There's, I'm not going to spend time tonight because there's time doesn't allow it, but there's a huge, uh, uh, contemporary uh, body of research that that essentially confirms the early 19th century transcendentalists of, of uh, Emerson and Thoreau and Olmsted uh, about the idea that there's something about nature and exposure to nature and landscape and the outdoors that affects the immune system. Uh, this was the beginning of uh, modern medicine as we know it. It's the uh, the beginning of the work of, uh, of Florence Nightingale in England, who advocated for fresh air and cleanliness uh, in, in hospital care, uh, aseptic uh, design of, of interiors, etc., and advocacy for patients being exposed to light and air. And so this, uh, this soup of, of growing awareness of the, the, the quality of landscape uh, that in fact begins to interact with body, mind, and spirit is actually a, a quite uh, ancient one, as evidenced by the spas of, um, <clears throat> of ancient Roman times, of Greek times, uh, of uh, in Germany, uh, all across the, uh, the continent. But that's another lecture. So what I'd like to do is, is proceed by saying that um, a, a supportive garden in an institutional, institutional setting, such as a university, a hospital, or in fact a town center, um, should state we care enough uh, about you to care for this garden or place. And it's a lost, uh, a lost art, the idea of caring for places that have been built. It seems to be uh, part, not part of the knowledge base of landscape architecture. We, we expertly design and execute works and then we go away. It provides a refuge uh, that bathes the senses in, in a different way each week, month, and month of the year. Uh, Olmsted was quoted in his book, um, 40 Years of Landscape Architecture, as saying, landscape architecture is landscape painting with time. And uh, that idea of time and the time it takes for a landscape to mature and the ever-changing cycles of color and texture and form uh, are an important aspect that I think is beginning to be missed because our sense of time is no longer 19th century, it's 21st, and it's very truncated. Three, uh, it is a metaphor for change and regeneration. It may also be a place of uh, comfort and support uh, with, within which to reflect upon loss. And this is applicable in hospital gardens, etc. but it's also applicable in the great cemetery designs that were done uh, in, uh, by Olmsted and um, in Auburn, um, a cemetery in uh, uh, Watertown. Uh, but the, uh, the larger point is that uh, the metaphor for change and regeneration is a key. Um, John Lyle wrote a book called Regenerative Design, and it's the idea that um, 
design that it merely slows the rate um, uh, of, of uh, degeneration is no longer acceptable. We need to create design that actually regenerates, regenerates energy and regenerates systems, cleans water, cleans the air. That kind of regenerative design is in a different order of magnitude than the kind of classic spatial design uh, that, we, that we have learned uh, through the history. Um, in, in the hospital realm, um, it, which I carry also to the, um, the public landscape, I personally, this is a personal perspective, uh, I don't think that gardens heal. Gardens don't heal us. Uh, we heal. Our immune system and our constitution, our DNA, conspire to, to heal or not. And, uh, but people heal themselves and in a supportive environment. And so the idea of gardens and garden design, uh, whether it's uh, at the civic scale or the small, uh, the small garden scale, uh, is one that should be conceived of as being a place that, um, that modifies uh, immunological systems, uh, modifies galvanic skin responses, uh, and modifies stress. Uh, this is a, a, a really a clinically established uh, fact. It's not a speculation. It was speculation in Olmsted's time. It was a great leap of faith that, that uh, landscape is good and, and being in the fresh air is good. It's now demonstrably uh, a, a known fact in clinical trials. If you read Biophilia by E.O. Wilson, uh, it's a thick book that is merely just a bunch of case studies that indicate that cross-culturally. Design is a means to create a supportive, uh, a healing environment. That is, if you think about design is not uh, an end in itself, but in fact a means for accomplishing something that has extrinsic worth, meaning it has meaning other than itself. A piece of art on the wall, a, a Rothko or a, um, a famous uh, Renoir, has intrinsic value that we go to and we see the beauty of the painting. It may have some extrinsic value in that it has a cultural experience, but the landscape has the potential of having extrinsic value that is beyond itself, beyond the design. It affects systems, uh, biology systems, ecological systems, social systems, and cultural systems. That's a heavy charge to, uh, to lay on uh, <laughs> budding landscape architects. But the idea of, of using design to accomplish larger ends than itself is a, is a key concept that I'd like to come back to uh, later. Um, the caring, the public uh, garden, the, uh, the caring public garden uh, transforms the mundane of everyday uh, life and uses plants that normally are found in uh, great estates such as Biltmore, et cetera, and places them in, in um, uh, the mundane landscape. So I'm going to show you some examples of that in Williamsburg. Uh, I recently went to Biltmore, visited Biltmore in uh, North Carolina, in Asheville, North Carolina. And I noted that everything you see at Biltmore, uh, you find in Central Park. That is all the, all the same ornament, the same uh, tools and the tricks, uh, the layouts, uh, the details uh, are in Biltmore, which was built after Central Park. So th these kind of interchangeability of this kind of civic scale work and the private um, uh, millionaire's mansions, of bringing those things into the public realm uh, is an important concept. And, and most public design is actually under-designed uh, and it's a, uh, almost an impoverished uh, environment. It um, reinvigorates the concept of public landscape. That is, the public uh, meaning should be for everyone. Uh, and in, I include uh, rabbits and microorganisms as well. And a, a garden that's not, a, and ha not a hospitable to microorganisms and, um, and rabbits and worms uh, is not a garden. Uh, it creates a sense of ownership and expectation. That is, in, in the public realm, if you're truly connecting with the public that you're serving, there should be some kind of psychic connection over time. In sociology, that time is about 10 years. That is, the, that's about a 10-year social lag uh, in a process called reification, where something, some phenomenon in everyday uh, perception becomes real 
in the, in the uh, uh, subconscious as opposed to merely external observation. So uh, on year one, it's, oh, look at those people planting flowers and doing funny things in that garden. Uh, uh, year 10 is, oh, our garden is beautiful this year. And that's the difference between this idea of ownership uh, and when, when something becomes reified or real uh, at the subconscious level uh, of a population, that's the connection that you're seeking. So this is my, the next two slides are my favorite slides because uh, it's an existential uh, moment. When we see uh, a little garden bed that's right in front of the gas station in Wil Williamsburg. It's in front of Siki's garage. And uh, this gas station uh, is a, um, a, a landmark. And notice uh, the little islands uh, in the background. Uh, that's part of a project where we, where we actually reconfigured the, uh, the roadway and the state uh, built it and uh, created a, a pedestrian um, friendly peninsula. Um, so this next slide is, is the same place uh, in uh, July. And so the idea, if I said existential, meaning uh, every landscape is a place of potential. And what we're orchestrating as landscape architects uh, in, in either simple ways, using simple perennials, and I use perennials because it's um, the, the most a apolitical thing you can do, and it's more effective than urinating for, to mark territory. And uh, this, uh, this example of, uh, of the display is an important one. Uh, when they accommodate daily life, and this is parking along the main road that goes through Northamp uh, Northampton and Williamsburg, in this case we're merely planting perennials, uh, putting two feet of sod so people get out of their car and they can stand on something other than a bed or, or, or mud. And um, uh, the, uh, the planting beds are merely the length of a car with a three-foot path between each bed. So it, it merely is accommodating uh, parked cars and allowing people to move through the bed as, as well as along a side of it. This is called the Williamsburg Walk of Flowers. Uh, and also using these things we can uh, uh, indicate local landmarks, in this case the general store where everybody buys ice cream. Uh, there are benches that have been placed where people sit, buy ice cream, sit down, and watch the flowers. Uh, we can also re redefine lost space, uh, uh, merely uh, with a simple uh, device of uh, three foot high uh, plantings that change over time uh, from the early spring to, um, to now. Uh, we can uh, use fragrant flowers to screen cars just as well as we can uh, uh, earth and, and fragrant flowers, just as well as a fence or, or uh, coniferous materials or, or ericaceous materials. Uh, we can also use them for accent and bloom to create um, something uh, to, that, that animates the place uh, year round. And uh, those of you who don't like perennials, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful world. Uh, all these plants, uh, I'll, I'll summarize a little bit later about the care. Uh, all these plants have an ongoing care routine that's all organic as well. In the wintertime, uh, the places uh, receive a, a boughs of mulch for a seasonal effect, but also uh, to protect uh, the, uh, the perennials. Uh, this is a local library. Uh, by the way, this heroic wall I, I built uh, over a summer, it'll, it'll never fall. It's, it's built to Roman specifications. So uh, this is an example of um, using plants uh, to uh, transform a simple, a new addition to a library with, to make it accessible. And so we see this accessible path uh, ramping up at less than 5% uh, a, a set of steps. And the, the idea is to move people through the plants as opposed to uh, around them. So that the idea is to make, force people to move into the plants and, and through them. So the ongoing care, to summarize this uh, 
this little, very brief little, because we don't have a lot of time, a very brief synopsis of this 14-year uh, project uh, that I've been working on uh, is a series of uh, lessons that I've learned. One is that um, each year uh, all the beds are raked uh, of the previous mulch, which we use uh, locally produced uh, uh, triple ground uh, bark mulch, not, not wood chips. And uh, we take away the con contaminated um, uh, soil because of the road salt for, a, for an area 15 feet beyond the curb. And that area is treated with calcium sulfate or gypsum at a rate of about 20 to 40 pounds per 100 square feet. Now that, that's 100 square feet, not 1,000. That's a very dense treatment. And what that does chemically is that the cal calcium sulfate, the sulfate radical ionizes with the sodium and makes it uh, water soluble and it leaches out of the soil and breaks the bonds with the soil particles and so plants then can take up potassium again. Um, so it's a way of uh, getting rid of soil, salt poisoning. That, that's every year. We use about a half a ton uh, every year. Uh, two, uh, we, we weed and, and add fresh uh, mulch every year and when we, when we add fresh mulch, we always thro throw down an organic equivalent of about 5-10-5 to add a little bit of nitrogen uh, to, to deal with the decay, uh, the up na nitrogen uptake of the decaying um, uh, mulch. Um, uh, we inoculate in May all the beds and lawns with uh, beneficial ne nematodes, which spend all their life cycle attacking five different kinds of grubs. So we use no chemicals uh, for, for grub control. We use uh, uh, un uneven and uneven results. We use corn gluten uh, for crabgrass uh, pre-emergent. It's uh, not perfected yet. Uh, we, we feed with uh, low nitrogen fertilizers and we use uh, <coughs> biological controls. Uh, you, you, you're familiar with them, BT, um, uh, neem oil, and uh, a series of uh, other uh, products that are available. So this, um, from the mundane, we look at this idea of merely uh, transforming a place in everyday's life by adding color and fragrance in, in ways outside the bank, outside the market, the, the post office, uh, the places where people go every day. So they don't have to go to a park to see these things. It's, it's part of their everyday life. And this is what I call civic design. And I, um, uh, we uh, have a group of people that help. I don't do this all myself. I do a lot of it myself. And I have been, and I probably will until I can anymore. But we have a group of about 10 people, and we call ourselves the Williamsburg Deadhead Society. And it's a group of volunteers. We have our own t-shirts. And they um, literally deadhead the, the flowers, weed, and cut back in the, in the fall uh, and haul the, uh, the stuff to a mulch pile. Which brings us to this idea of social agency. That the landscape architects are equipped with a series of unique skills uh, that are interpretive ones, but they're technical as well. The issue is, to what end do we apply these skills, and to what end do we uh, advocate uh, the use of design strategies? And so I introduced this idea of social agency, which is a fancy way of saying, what is the social purpose of your work? And the, the summary takeaway point from the Williamsburg study is that uh, to be overwhelmed with natural beauty is, is a right. It's not a privilege. And everyone should have access to it. And landscape architects have the capacity to, in fact, uh, create those environments that overwhelm us with natural beauty. And that was, should be one of the, 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 the uh, prime directives for our work, wherever we are, whether it's a small scale garden or a very large civic, uh, civic scale place in New York City or Chicago, or Los Angeles, or San Francisco, or even Dallas. Um, the idea is that we should think about this idea of creating uh, overwhelming beauty uh, for uh, uh, the experience of uh, daily life. Uh, this next one is uh, a, a process uh, It was built in 2004, but the planning and design of it uh, lasted uh, for about three years. And it was a project uh, at the Franklin Medical Center in Greenfield, Massachusetts. And uh, it involves a courtyard 
uh, that uh, was used by at, at the time by doctors, nurses, uh, patients, uh, patients' families uh, to be uh, adjacent to the cafeteria and uh, to to uh, exchange the dramas that occur in a hospital landscape. And every day, um, someone can be receiving good news, such as um, um, something is in remission, to bad news is that you've got uh, one week left. And that happens uh, side by side. Uh, people can be sitting in different places and hearing uh, this news. So this idea of, of um, designing for an environment that is dealing with people in the most vulnerable stage of their lives is an extraordinary challenge that is something different than just doing good design work. So there's a body of um, a knowledge uh, called uh, uh, health, health design that is uh, both instructive to architects and landscape architects. And there's a, uh, a group of landscape architects in ASLA who specialize in the study and research area of uh, dealing with uh, uh, healthcare, healthcare design. Um, design uh, is never something that you just conjure up in your brain. Uh, you conjure form and uh, juxtaposition you, uh, uh, and, and colors and textures, etc. But the actual content is something that must be derived from something other than yourself. In this case, uh, it's, it's critically important. So we use six focus groups. And uh, the focus groups um, were patients, nurses, doctors, staff, community helpers, and families, which is typically what you find in hospital settings. Uh, a lot of neighborhoods, families, and people who are former patients that volunteer. And um, uh, through a long process of uh, questionnaires and, and uh, uh, focus group conferences, we found that um, this garden should have flowers for color, fragrance, and change, uh, water effects, but no spray uh, due to disease vectors. And the water would have to be chlorinated uh, because of uh, uh, disease and mosquitoes, et cetera. Uh, shade and, and uh, sun options, shade especially for people undergoing chemo and um, chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Uh, the, uh, UV rays are very bad. And uh, benches and tables so that you can have people engage in solitary conversation as well as group conversation and tables uh, where you can partake of coffee, tea, and, and lunches. Uh, accessible walkways for people who are ambu ambulatory but need wheelchairs or, or walkers. Uh, and also, the elderly people ask for a bench swing, a swing, uh, a bench that's tied to chains that swings. Uh, group function areas, that the hospital had a program that, was a, uh, that integrated all the arts, the performing arts and the fine arts, including paintings, um, uh, concerts by string quartets, bluegrass bands, and jazz, um, as well as information conferences uh, the, uh, for the community uh, uh, on heart, on heart uh, ailments, on renal functions, whatever it is that the uh, community of patients would, would receive. The courtyard became uh, the place that, that was envisioned for uh, this happening under a tent uh, and other so also social fundraising events as well. So what I'm getting at is that this program uh, for this park uh, or this garden is not something that, that should come from the landscape architect. It's got to come from the users. And, and what you are as a landscape architect is a facilitator, an interpreter. Uh, you're an enabler. And you're trying to develop a professional perspective on all, each the implications of each one of these demands. And the spa their spatial, uh, budgetary, and, um, and uh, uh, other kinds of functional uh, interactions of, of these things that need the design sensibility of how to aggregate those things in a sensible, coherent whole. That's what design is. So this process that I'm trying to suggest to you is one that uh, really is applicable to almost I mean, everything you do, frankly. So what we did is establish uh, a, um, a lot of time and energy creating uh, scale models that tried to indicate how these elements might um, uh, be seen in the courtyard. Uh, this was uh, an elaborate one showing the, um, 
the uh, uh, tables and chairs under a trellis to, to block the western sun. Uh, we use scale figures and some uh, H as a quarter scale. So we used uh, people embracing the, the, this. Um, these people are, are actually a man and woman embracing uh, it, the kind of thing you'd see in, in the courtyard. So we're trying to mimic, be mimetic of what you'd actually experience in the real place. So these are our true existing glass walls that look out onto the courtyard. Uh, there's a first floor and a second floor. So that's the, that's the second floor. Here's the first floor. So these are some of the examples of benches of uh, the, the pergola uh, and, and flowers and, uh, and plants that uh, create color. And here's some uh, construction. Uh, this is, uh, you're seeing this place uh, built. In this case, you're looking at sub, uh, subgrade. And the subgrade is established. Uh, this tree was lowered by a crane early in the process, and uh, topsoil was placed around it. Um, uh, this is the, the just after it was finished. Uh, this is um, a year later when the perennial is starting to. And in fact, a year later, they actually added on to a, uh, the courtyard as a building. And I'm standing at the doorway of this new building. And um, so immediately the courtyard was changed within a year. The radiology unit moved. And so the waiting room for the radiology movement was moved so that it could look out onto the courtyard. The non-spray water feature was a budgetary constraint. It's very simple, just a little bubbling. Um, there's the swing, excuse me. There's the, um, the swing, the swing that was requested. And it's a place for conversation um, of, of really life and death circumstances. The other thing uh, I'd like to um, remind you of is as soon as you start uh, consecrating a place with engraved bricks, this is typically a common thing to do, you, you, you know, memorialize um, people and events with engraved bricks and people donate money. And in fact, it, it paid for the bricks, the cost of the bricks. And uh, th as soon as you do that, though, uh, you memorialize it and the place cannot fail. It has become a sacred place, and that's why you need a plan for, uh, for maintenance and management in perpetuity. And that should be part of the design plan. It's like what I call a manual of ongoing care. Every project that you do should have equipped with it a manual of ongoing care, instructions of how to effect um, care for this place. Uh, you, you, uh, Assemble materials lists, just like an interior designer, you assemble a materials list and try to illustrate them with uh, um, analogous uh, samples. So um, the lessons learned in this uh, enterprise was the design landscape should support wellness. And to do so, it must be a vibrant living place, teeming with life. And I, I want to uh, do a little anecdote to explain um, how I re realized this in a, in a kind of stark way. Uh, shortly after um, the gardens were built in Williamsburg around the bank and gardens uh, around the you know, Seekies garage, et cetera, uh, I noticed that what I thought to be uh, vandalism. Uh, every morning I'd go by and somebody had scattered the, uh, the bark mulch onto the brick. So I would dutifully sweep it back. And the next morning, the same thing happened. And the third morning, I realized I should investigate. It was earthworms. At night, the, the, the earthworms are so um, uh, active that they were literally uh, um, churning up the, uh, the beds, mainly because we use a lot of bone meal to plant uh, chrysanthemum, I mean bulbs, uh, daffodils, et cetera. Great um, worm food. The public uh, place requires uh, ongoing care in order to provide a supportive and thriving environment. So it, once the, a landscape is built, it, if it doesn't thrive, uh, the idea dies. And, and so does the, the kind of connection or bonding between the so-called users or public. So it's one of the, I think, the weakest areas of our design education and, and practice is the specification of ongoing care afterwards. 
Third is uh, public places must instill an expectation, meaning that people come to places and they'd expect to see, just like people go to Arnold Arboretum, uh, or where do they go around here? Where's a place, a, a, a place of great beauty that people go to see the lilacs or they see the, the roses bloom? Is, the, the botanical garden. When you go to the botanical garden, you go with an expectation, high expectation, that you're going to see these great roses or you're going to smell the lilacs. When that doesn't happen in one year, or when they're overwhelmed, if they become uh, diseased, it's a it's it's death. It's a death, and and it becomes less regenerative to the human spirit. So this is what I'm talking about. It, it's one more layer of responsibility uh, to burden your brain with. Uh, as well as well as budget and everything else that we're burdened with. So the Quiet Reflections Garden, I'm going to show you, this is more of an academic perspective uh, to show you the process drawings and the kind of thinking that went on. This is a, a, a project, um, we're almost done. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is a project that was done on behalf of a bereavement group of parents who lost children. Um, through diseases and accidents, etc., and they wanted a place to to memorialize them. So we created this unique. Um, I helped them uh, find a site, uh, and uh, we we actually built a, a, a park, and it's called Angel Park. It's a Roman Catholic uh, group, and I said, you know, I'm very squeamish about um, uh, mixing uh, in a secular society, mixing religious content. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm I persuaded them to refer to it as the Quiet Reflections Garden. But, of course, it's, it's always been the Angel Park uh, to them. And uh, the other point is that I would, we, we uh, made a site for a statue, and um, I was told that th they were uh, negotiating with a, a well-known artist to create a bronze cast bird, um, uh, to be a metaphor, a bird. And I said, that's great. So we set the site. Um, for the uh, statue, and we poured the concrete uh, base. And in the meantime, somebody donated a, con a 600 pound concrete angel, which is in the park. So um, it it's a dicey thing because uh, everybody doesn't believe in angels uh, in a secular society. But um, nevertheless, we pr proceeded with it in the, fo with the following result. Um, this is a little sketch plan showing. Um, uh, this is the existing public school is up here. Uh, the Veterans Memorial Park is right here. The Grange Hall is here, and, and the Williamsburg Historical Society is there. And there's the general store uh, where the ice cream is. So it's a prime location. It's the site of an old um, old uh, equipment shed that has been tur torn down in the 50s, uh, town-owned land. The design concept is um, it aims to provide visitors and town uh, residents with a place of reflection for sitting and, um, and strolling. Uh, the general garden plan shows um, uh, a little terrace, uh, white fir, Abies con color, an underused uh, plant, I think, um, dwarf uh, winterberry, a uh, magnolia. Um, uh, it's a stellata, and um, these are uh, uh, autumnalis uh, cherries, an amelanchor, and these are all um, shamrock uh, ilex glabra. Uh, we purposely dealt with uh, issues of uh, public functions so that, that, that the central lawn area has to accommodate a um, 20 by 30 foot tent, which can uh, can accommodate 50 people for dinner, or or more for a lecture or concert. This place is used as a, um, a concert venue. Uh, there's a there's a continuous stone wall, a, a seat a seat wall that goes all the way around it. This is the concept sketch. I'd like you to try to remember this because I'm going to show you the um, 2013. Um, shot that shows almost the same information. Um, this is uh, merely a, the, taking the sloping land and terracing it to create a, a very pragmatic uh, small park. This is the existing site, and that's the 
That's the Grange Hall, the general store. This is the road that goes to the school. And um, this is the, in progress. Uh, all the stone was donated by a local quarry. Uh, I built everything with the help of um, town equipment to uh, grade, uh, place, uh, sub, um, place sub bases, and uh, uh, lay electrical and uh, drainage lines. Uh, this is one of those quirky things. This little stone was actually found in the pile exactly as it's shown. It's not cut. It just it, it was uh, naturally split into a trapezoid. So I just uh, laid it up as a joke, as a keystone in the arch. Um, and it's a, um, I told everybody it's a significant marker of an uh, ancient meridian that runs through the park. And uh, they didn't know whether to believe me or not. Um, th this is the, the infamous uh, statue base that you'll see in a moment. This is the park uh, right after completion, and I'd like to, uh, the next three slides, I try to show you the uh, time, the passage of time. This is uh, 2008, uh, right, uh, the fall of 2008. Uh, this is 2011. And this is a 2013. And so the 2013 begins to resemble the original sketch cross-section. That is, um, you're, you're trying to uh, show how the, how the inkberry will enclose the space, how the um, uh, flowers, et cetera, uh, offer a supportive function, et cetera. And uh, so, so something that you should be thinking about in your design is, in five-year increments, uh, what, what do you imagine it to look like? And you can do that by, by merely starting uh, your own uh, portfolio of observed phenomena of every time something is built, you take a photograph of it and go back, if you can, in five years and take another photograph. And you create your own longitudinal study. And that's exactly what you do in professional practice. But there's no reason to wait until you graduate. You can do that now. Every time you see a construction site, it, you should come to a screeching halt and either sketch something or take a photograph to, to fix it in time and then go back. Because you're interested in how landscapes change over time and then what you do as a designer to orchestrate the change. That's essentially what you're doing with design. Uh, these are some uh, uh, views of uh, the, the mature perennials. This is a cultivar of, uh, of uh, Echinacea and uh, Phlox and Perovskia. Here's an example of uh, changing the design to, to uh, link to future, future work. This is a, a little uh, a, a walkway that has steps that, that uh, feeds the parking lot of the general store. Uh, but we also put a bench there because uh, the view of the bench is a future project. And that's a great tea garden between the uh, historical society and the general store. And so that might be another a future park. So the idea is that every time you do a project like Olmsted, you think of how this project could spawn another and another. And you try to create networks of, of contiguous green spaces and eventually contiguous canopies, which is great for uh, birds, uh, birds and um, insects, etc. And also, uh, give you an idea of some of the, the techniques. Uh, we know that uh, we're lay laying the stone, but we know the stone uh, is split face, but the place where the brick is going to abut uh, needs to be uh, precise. So we actually cut the stone with a diamond saw where we're um, uh, at the grade where the brick is going to be. We know that because we, we, sh we know what the grading is. And so uh, uh, we lay it out uh, with a mason's line and so when we go to lay the brick, um, it's exactly a, a perfectly straight line. We also know that there's no such thing as surgical insertion of anything in the landscape. So that when you think of a two-foot wall, you're dealing with a four-foot excavation because uh, you need to backfill uh, with, uh, with fabric and, uh, and crushed stone for stability and, and drainage. Uh, so uh, you should 
you know, to talk about your clients, et cetera, that there's no such thing as surgically inserting anything. It's a disruptive, invasive procedure, like any other surgery. So this is the same view uh, showing the finishes uh, right after it was done. Uh, this is um, a little later. This is the, in 2011. Uh, uh, this next shot shows the power of a simple temporary fill of um, perennials. This is in June, uh, yeah, in late May, early June. This is uh, in late June, early July. And all they are is uh, little, little uh, um, thinnings of uh, chrysanthemum uh, becky, a, 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 um, six inches on center, uh, like a ground cover and they just uh, bloom like crazy. Eventually the trees uh, will completely um, fill in and we remove the flowers as the trees fill in and plant them somewhere else. This is the winter, last winter, uh, showing how large the trees are and they're beginning to start to touch. And they're screening out uh, the buses and the cars uh, of the parking lot behind it. On the school side, where, which is west, we, we just have a, a riot of color. Uh, Rebecca, yellow, yellow uh, daffodils, uh, yellow um, uh, daylilies, and uh, echinacea and Russian sage. Uh, oftentimes in your design work, you're, also, you're asked to uh, make maps showing the migratory paths of animals. We very rarely show the migratory paths of people. <laughs> in this case, we found this rutted little path behind this um, utility garage, which was uh, made by the teachers walking from the school to the general store getting coffee. So we found an old um, uh, sill stone in, while we were excavating, we had it engraved and it says, uh, teacher's coffee walk. Uh, so that little stone right there, it says, engraved stone. It's a dedication to the teachers who walked this. We widened the path and edged it um, and, and uh, paved it with four inches of uh, uh, graded aggregate. So the conclusion here is that um, uh, any garden you do, including this one, is that uh, it requires some kind of administrative uh, organization to perpetuate it and to make certain uh, that it receives ongoing care. Uh, we did this by uh, organizing another group called the Redemption Society in which uh, there are about 12 people who work shifts uh, collecting bottles and cans at the local transfer station, converting it into cash and depositing it into a special account a non-interest bearing account, which will eventually um, convert to a 501c3 tax exempt um, organization uh, to provide about $5,000 a year uh, to pay for mowing, raking, uh, the gypsum, the fertilizer, uh, and uh, f uh, uh, drip irrigation, uh, seasonal changes, uh, electrical repairs, etc. So uh, this idea then in, in uh, community work is that it cannot fail. It, it's, you, you're really memorializing public space in a way that requires some kind of ongoing care beyond my lifetime. So I'm trying, uh, I, got, I think I got about 10 more years to get it all figured out and get it organized into a, a trust fund as well as a, a board of trustees and a group of people dedicated to perpetuating this thing. Just like, um, the Nature Conservancy does, uh, the Central Park Conservancy does. In other words, every great work requires some kind of conserving organization that oversees its, its ongoing care. Um, the last thing we're gonna look at is a little technical, it's a very brief thing. It's part of the work I'm doing as, as part of the, creating a, a greenway along the Mill River, uh, which goes out to the Connecticut River and uh, travels through all the hill towns. And as it passes through Williamsburg, uh, I'm working on a way of trying to connect to the river whenever we can. This next project was an opportunity to do that. Uh, there are a lot of old mill walls along the way, and the, our library, the one that you saw, 
the garden in the front. Uh, in the back, there's a river and an old wall with eroded, a badly eroded um, wall cap and wall itself, and also root damage from trees planted too close to the wall. So this project uh, was a, a combined effort. We wanted to uh, restore the wall, uh, regrade it so that water no longer traveled over the wall into the river, th therefore stopping the erosion, which would also in in increase the water quality of the Mill River, as well as provide a platform for the reinstallation of an old um, wrought iron or steel, I mean, uh, you know, iron fence that used to be there that's no longer there. Uh, the library found an old iron fence on eBay from upstate New York, and they bought it, uh, had it um, sandblasted, galvanized, and painted with two coats of epoxy paint. So what you're about to see is this restoration. So what we did was uh, to uh, re refit the stones, remove the uh, invasive uh, roots, um, uh, create a base, uh, poured a concrete, a reinforced concrete cap. Um, we had um, existing caps that we could reuse, and then uh, we, we, from the same quarry that, the, that those caps came from, we had new ones uh, made and cut, and it was donated, by the way and uh, we uh, restored it. So this is a, a part of the way, what we did was we, um, this tree, this tree right here was removed uh, afterwards. Uh, its roots were actually pushing out the wall. Um, and uh, we um, mortared these uh, large stones, uh, some uh, two feet by five or six or seven feet uh, long. Uh, and uh, then we drilled uh, through them with a diamond core saw, and we uh, uh, placed these uh, two-inch uh, steel posts and set them ver vertically erect at, at the proper spacing, set them in fast uh, hydraulic cement, fast drying uh, setting hydraulic cement, and then connected the uh, fence uh, portions. And this. Uh, essentially created a new park because it was a safe place for children. Um, uh, the fencing here satisfies the law. Uh, the, the vertical slats are four inches apart, and it can't be any more than that. And uh, it's um, five feet tall. So this is the, the new wall that it restored. Uh, this is the new space, which is now used uh, extensively by a, uh, a farmer's market, as well as people sitting in chairs just staring at the water. And the, the, um, the library has Wi-Fi, so people come out and do their uh, computer business. Uh, the detail is that we created a, uh, an excavated, we excavated um, two feet down um, and three feet uh, wide trench at the top of the wall and we placed a fabric and, excuse me, crushed stone and fabric uh, and then backfilled with topsoil so that uh, all, those, all the water that comes from the lawn doesn't go into the river, it goes infiltrates. So these cobblestones are actually non-mortared. They act as a, as a curtain drain. This is a little terrace that commemorates the place of an old dam that used to be there. And so this little sitting area is equipped with electricity um, and um, Wi-Fi and uh, Chianenthus virginicus. So my conclusion is that um, the German philosopher Oswald Spangler uh, was, is quoted often, he was quoted by Stanley White often, um, the landscape is a mirror of our cultural soul. and. Um, the goal of design should not be to produce an artifact. That is, it, it shouldn't be about things that we do. It's really the goal of design is to create an outcome. That is, what can the things that we do help accomplish? So the thing that we do, that, that, we, uh, that we accomplish, is not the accomplishment. It's what the things help us do. And so the garden, um, the, the urban design, uh, the 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 cemetery or uh, the art museum forecourt. Uh, these are the things uh, that you produce, but the issue then is that how do we use those things to 
effectuate uh, a social setting that is, uh, um, is equitable and is open to all and that is thriving with life, not some pastiche of, of um, imaginary uh, aluminum trees, but in fact a living landscape. Not only a living landscape, but in, in the spirit of John Lyle, a landscape that actually regenerates life, um, that is regenerative and, and not, not consumptive. And it's a very big challenge. It's hard. It's like designing a lead uh, platinum building. It's, it's almost impossible. But it's the goal that we should all be uh, striving for. So uh, that's my, uh, my little sermon <coughs> for tonight. And uh, thank you very much. And I'd be glad to take any questions if you have them. Yes. So you actually um, you go, go to all your sites personally and like contribute to the actual physical work. Yes, I did. Um, I built. It took me um, the library wall, which I'm most proud. Uh, <laughs> it took a uh, you know, all spring. It's just all hand work. It's all hand chiseled. There's no the library wall is no cutting. There's no sawing. It's just all hand chiseled of a uh, of granite nice. And yes, I did uh, all the brickwork, the electrical work, um, planting. Um, it's. I think that's like a, a really important part in sort of um, informing your design work is like being hands on. Design. Uh, yes, I think you you need that, but I think you need to be analytical about what you're doing when you're doing hands on work, uh, and so it's like the Zen of motorcycle repair. In other words, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It's what you're learning at the time. So you're trying to build a knowledge base. And if you're just doing labor, uh, that's not very useful. If you're doing labor and trying to ask the question, um, uh, what is the craft that I'm working on? What is, what's its history? What are the tools that I need? Uh, and uh, what are good outcomes and what are bad outcomes? Um, you need to do research to find out uh, how to do it. and. Um, I think that it's a very important uh, area. Uh, it, it, it's idiosyncratic. I mean, I just love to build things. Everybody doesn't. I mean, some people are klutzes. They, they just they keep hitting their hand. And so I think that um, uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting a protocol that everybody has to build something. It's just that uh, I did it. Um, but you can also uh, help others do it. So it doesn't mean that the model isn't that you have to do it all. The model is is uh, you need to engage a process that gets it done. And if you're a better manager, then you can help uh, other people do the work. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, I know you're all tired and you have many bridges to, to cross. There'll be, there'll be uh, more, a chance to ask more questions from all the way outside. Uh, so thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. Do you have any grandchildren that live in the area? No, I don't have any grandchildren. Okay, so what a great legacy. Oh. It's beautiful. Thank you.